Blog Talk Radio. Here at ACO Radio, American Communications Online, or any affiliated stations or websites are not responsible for what guest hosts or call-ins may say. All programming is intended for informational and entertainment purposes only. T Radio. We're having a little technical difficulty with our uh, board today, and there's nobody in my New York office to help me. So I'm going to have to call uh, at least Richard. I don't have the. Uh, let me see if I can get Richard on here. He's been trying to call, and now I've got to get his phone number. So let's do this. So hopefully we can get something going on here. Let's see. Uh, Zero nine two three. Okay, I'm calling you on the other line. I mean, I've got to hang up and call you right back. Okay. Let's see. We're on this one. Okay. I've got to remember what phone is doing what. Ongoing call. All right. We want to keep this one okay. going. Oh, you're on this. How'd you get on this one? I don't know. You just dialed me. I did? Yeah. Let's see, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. All righty. Well, good. I, I guess we're recording. I, this is very confusing. Uh, I yes, don't have you on the board, uh, but I've got th- a whole bunch of Richard Knights on my cell phone. I don't know what's going on, folks. So, welcome aboard. This is all Zinc, and uh, we've got all these wonderful companies out there, but they're showing when we call in to our guest call-in number. If you're trying to call in, we apologize. Now it's just going to see we're doing paranormal show, TJMRC2 Radio, because I had to end my other episode because we couldn't get in on the uh, phone numbers. Very interesting, but I will ask them about that Monday, Richard, but I think we're recording. Uh, it shows two two nine four seven four zero nine two three. That's you, right, Richard? Yes, that's that's correct. Okay. Well, uh, it shows you're on the board, but I don't really know how exactly. So we'll just move forward. Richard, go ahead and introduce yourself and pull our list up today, and we're going to make this work. Um, not the world's a really strange place lately. <laughs> So this is a paranormal show, and we're really having a time getting on with supernatural kind of uh, topics today. We had people invited, but uh, in New York, lines are busy uh, where we do the uh, station connect like a tower, Richard. Uh, So you and I would just have to carry the Universal Society on the planet. But uh, introduce people to to you, if you don't mind introducing yourself, and you will be the no. co-host today and help me and you and I, and I just don't know how people are going to get in. Maybe the sur- surface will, uh, maybe they'll fix it, but there's nobody in the office till Monday. They don't hire right now during this COVID-19. They're not keeping anyone. So uh, this is TJ Mars CT Radio, folks, and uh, we've had three successful shows with Richard. So this is a new series, and uh, 
Richard Thomas Knight, he is in Valdosta, Georgia. He's a well-known uh, paranormal investigator and an investigator of other things in his past lives. But uh, Richard, what can you add to this paranormal show today? Because uh, uh, we're gonna just use, use some ideas of how we do things in the supernatural world, I guess. So tell him your okay. very short bio. All right. Well, um, I came into this life completely aware of who I am and where I came from. I was born with 14 senses. So from the get-go, as soon as I came out of the womb, I was very much able to talk and speak, which freaked people out. Um, and from that point forward, I had ET experience at the age of five. I was abducted, and they put a tracker in my nasal passage, which wasn't remained there for 30 years. And in the interim, of course, all throughout my life, uh, I, I have been drawn onto uh, sacred spaces, interesting rituals, interesting initiations, interesting uh, paranormal occurrences, uh, interesting interactions with supernatural beings, uh, entities from other places, zones, dimensions, etc. And I've, I've gone on to lots of hauntings um, and been invited into lots of people's houses that needed clearing. Uh, whether the entity was positive or negative, they were annoying, usually to the children, and so basically they were just simply banished. Uh, but to all of our great paranormal associations, research societies, and all of the, the, the great enter, entertainers who are placing YouTube uh, videos out in regards to your actual research projects at various haunted places like uh, asylums and hospitals and all these kind of things, uh, I would I would recommend very strongly that you follow these procedures before you even enter such a place. I would like you to ground and center, call in your higher self for divine protection, okay? And that way you're connected to the earth and you're divinely protected so that when you enter into such a space that nothing can cling to you, okay? Because you are entering a space where there may be positive, there may be negative entities, there may be residual energies, there may be all kinds of entities that are hanging around the place trying to control even spirits before they were allowed to disincarnate fully from the physical. So with all of that in mind, even though you have lots of electrical equipment to record you know, images and to record sounds, EVPs, and all of this kind of thing, I would strongly recommend uh, as a fellow practitioner that you ground, center, Focus and bring in your higher self and all your guardians and protective agents before you even enter such a place. You can do so as a group. You can do so individually, uh, kind of like holding a mini prayer session, because basically you want to make certain that you are fully protected so that nothing that you encounter in this space actually attaches to you. Okay, that's the number one rule, and that should be foremost to all practitioners, no matter where they're coming from or what kind of recording devices they're coming from or any places that they're visiting in the country. And of course, we gladly welcome all of our Southeast Paranormal Research brothers, all our Northeast Paranormal uh, Research brothers, and all of those in the East Coast and all of those in the Southwest and the South. Um, north of us, uh, I mean, such states as our own, which is Florida, of course, Georgia, of course, uh, then we have Kentucky, we have Tennessee, we have Ohio, we have Wisconsin, we have New York, we have Rhode Island, we have Michigan, we have Indiana, Indiana we have Texas, we have Mississippi, and all kinds of different states that are surrounding us, all of which have very active paranormal research study groups that do, in fact, conduct investigations, as I've seen lots of your YouTube reports on YouTube. Um, and I, a big hi, hello, hello, and how are y'all doing? And welcome you to the program. If, you, if you're able to get on with us um, to share some of your insights, your encounters, and so forth. I uh, personally, like I said, have thousands of encounters, either in the spirit realm, by spirits who have haunted places, or by residual energy, which basically was base, basically banished. And then, of course, dark entities, which in turn, were also banished back to where they came from. So... As a standard modem of operation, of course, if you invite spirits to interact with you, understand that, yes, they are not only going to speak to you, but they may well touch you, and they may well move objects around you. 
They may throw things at you. They may throw things in any given room. They may uh, give you a full body apparition, or they may be nothing more than clusters of balls of light. Uh, there are all kinds of aspects that you're going to run into. Dark entities, of course, once you enter a room, you're going to automatically feel like your energy is trying to be, uh, something is trying to drain you of all your energy or give you a severe headache or make you nauseous to your stomach and all this kind of thing. And that's a severe indication that there is a negative presence in the room. So again, when you run into these circumstances, again, you call for your guardian, your protection and everything so that you are surrounded in white, gold, blue, green, red, and purple and pink light. So basically you could say rainbow light because that is the absolute spectrum of creative source. And once you surround yourself with this spectrum of light, then of course no dark entity can harm you. Okay. Because unfortunately that's my record going back historically since uh, these investigations have been going on since I have been here since 1955 and onward. Um, of course, as our technology, Technological skills developed, and we created all kinds of different machines to record all kinds of uh, magnetic interference and, you know, interference on the magnetic fields, uh, disturbances in all kinds of different uh, creative scenarios and so forth um, since development since the 90s, um, which is the last 30 years. And even that in, is a foremost history because, of course, lots of groups have investigated very well-known places, especially asylums. Um, in West Virginia and some also in Ohio and other places. And <clears throat> the recordings have verified that, in fact, yes, the place is haunted. There are, in fact, spirit, spiritual entities there in the perimeter of where you are actually recording them, either by camera or by EVP on voice recording or uh, bot machines that scramble and allow them to speak out through um, scrambled, scrambled uh, radio signals and so forth. I'm familiar with all the communication devices. However, I'm naturally gifted. So therefore, as a psychic medium, I do not need any physical device to indicate to me the spirits are present. Why? Because I can see them, hear them, and communicate with them directly, psychically, and intuitively. So this gift, of course, has been receiving a lot of different instances. And I would recommend again, you know, you fully prepare yourself for the unexpected because that's the best way to approach the kind of situation where you have a haunted place or possibly a house, whether it be a church, whether it be a hospital, whether it be an insane asylum, whether it be a hospital that had been an asylum, and, you know, where you have tuberculosis outbreaks, uh, large-scale deaths, um, like, uh, you know, different, different places. And, again, want to... Make certain that you are guarded to the, to the largest extent possible. Because if not, what's going to happen is any being, any entity that is confused and unaware of it, first off that they're dead, secondarily they're imprisoned or staying or haunting at a particular location. If you're not protected, they will attach themselves to you and you will find that you have a visitor at home with you at night when you leave the site that you're investigating. So, again, the secondary practice is the same that you did in the four practice, and that is to ground, center, call forth your protective energies and your protective team and your protective beings, and make certain that you are completely surrounded by gold, white light, the light of source, okay? And that all things are left where they are, and none may attach to you before you actually get in your vehicle to go home. These two prerequisites are absolutely mandatory for your safe practice in these kind of hauntings and instances of this nature. And I'm speaking directly from experience. I have done battle uh, with negative entities. I have done exorcisms of the possessed. I have done uh, banishings of haunting uh, indications where you have powerful spirits that are holding or trapping other spirits in place. Of course, I have undone residual energy numerous times. And of course, my heartfelt advice would be that we bring a, a solution to these situations rather than just an agonizing and recording and, you know, basically scientifically saying, yes, we have proven without a shadow of a doubt that someone is haunted, you know what I'm saying, whether it be their house, their home, or their church, or what have you. Yes, we have proven without a shadow of a doubt that someone is haunted, you know what I'm saying, 
whether it be their house, their home, or their church, or what have you. So, TJ, how's that? It says live on the air on the other station. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing jet lag because I'm hearing my voice being recorded, and it's like a, a three-second uh, interval. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. I don't know what the weather is in New York. Maybe I should look because we're getting – I put the category under paranormal uh, rather than spiritual, just so you know, Richard. But let me look at New York, uh, New York City, New York City weather, and see. I don't, I don't understand. I've never had this happen. This is my first time. I mean, I've heard people say that before when it didn't click on New York, but it didn't even show my show. It had deleted my show somehow. New York City, Saturday, five twenty-seven. Let's see, weather 48, uh, humidity 82, winds. Let's see, it doesn't say whether it's, uh, doesn't really say whether it's, I guess it's 48, huh? Or maybe it's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, let's see, folks. Well, anyway, uh, Rich, Richard, you and I have carried a show before, and we'll just do it today. So, Regarding paranormal societies, I guess what we should do is uh, I'll look up and see what, uh, let me see, paranormal societies. Let's start with it. Now, I started one way back years ago in 2007. Now, paranormalsocieties.com, the online paranormal society directory. Now, uh, that was who was invited, so I apologize if a haunting assistance contact form. <laughs> you can get it at paranormalsocieties.com. And uh, they were teaming up internationally with us today for paranormal groups. They've got a beautiful website. That's paranormalsocieties.com. And uh, is uh, interested in joining Paranormal Society. So they've got paranormal investigators. Follow us on Twitter to get free investigation leads. And uh, they have a paranormal list you can be on. And you can go to Twitter and get on it with Bill at Paranormal List. It says, Help with Hauntings, USA and Worldwide, owner of ParanormalSocieties.com. And uh, I had invited them, and they agreed. And uh, one of the girls uh, uh, is actually uh, an RN, she said. So uh, she was going to ask some of the other people to come on. But now the only way I could do it was it would be to call them. And uh, I'm I'm looking at Bill now. I heard some perhaps or something. Yeah. And well, I tried to call just a while ago and uh, talk paranormal new podcast. Uh, oh, that's me. Uh, psychic mini ring or something. Spreaker paranormal. Interesting. Well, let's see. Uh, this is it, it's so funny when you get flustered because uh, I had everything prepared to you know interview them, and now we're going to have to interview each other, I guess. But uh, I guess we could talk about. Uh, what we're going to do, Richard, because this looks really good. Haunting Assistant Contacts Form. They have a local, you can sign up at a society, which I did at right, Richard and I uh, under UAP. So let me go put, uh, pull that up, Richard, UAP Associates. Now, uh, Richard, I have put that up leaning more towards our U UFO groups, UFO Associates, E-Force Agency. Open source intelligence gathering made in USA cyberspace culture, virtual remote from home office after COVID-19. So I've got, we began activists, advocates for researchers and developers, engineers, surveillance, audio, video, cyberspace, business for oral and written archivists. So we've got ontologists, historians, researchers, aliens among us, internet, which is really big now, librarians, ufology, research, paranormal people, place and things. And we're going to create a who's who directory. And uh, the UAP full command understanding at all levels, I put up on UAP Association on our YouTube. And is anybody else having trouble with Facebook out there? Because some of mine work and some don't. I understand we're, we're, we're really, you know, having a lot of people out there joining. And a lot of things are being taken down. But if you are... Uh, someone that wants to be in our blogging network, please let me and Richard know. 
I have ACIR, ACO, and uh, UAP. And uh, hopefully we're going to get where we can get back out. Richard and I can handle up and down the interstate here between mine and his home for uh, future uh, events. And uh, the paranormal events, we have one here in, Parano uh, in Pensacola. Richard, do you know uh, what paranormal events are going on? I know Atlanta, but let's look. What do you have close to you? Do you know? Or can um, you probably Jacksonville or possibly, like you said, Pensacola or possibly further south into the Orlando area um, and further south than that into Key West. Um, and there are, there are lots and lots of groups up and down the Florida panhandle. Um, and there are lots of groups um, sort of spread all over Florida, but a lot of them have voice and some of them don't. Um, so it's a matter of, of connecting a lot of groups and bringing us all together so that we can, you know, have conversations and have dialogues and discussions and share, uh, share encounters, share experiences and all that kind of thing. Because that's basically what I was of the, of the understanding that that's my, what we might well introduce today. Now, if we go from a international dialogue, then of course we're expanding out from just the U.S. into uh, who knows how many numerous other countries. I mean, you know, there's Germany, there's Italy, there's uh, France, there's England, there's uh, you know Ireland, Scotland, Wales. All these places have haunted occurrences and they all have paranormal groups that in fact have been uh, set up and you know going out and, and, and adventuring into haunted places. Well there's a lot of groups that have uh, past life regression, paranormal readings and the study of paranormal activity folks and a lot of people tell me when I say I'm into paranormal they're like oh I'm scared of that. So the supernatural phenomenon and uh, some of the pantheons and the ancient cultures that include uh, ghosts and spirits and fairies and high powers of supernatural. The students may not recognize the field yet, uh, but neuroscience is getting close to understanding. And there's been a lot of television shows making the communication with angels and uh, intermediaries and the journey that we go through traveling and uh, revealing with the tarot, which I do, and uh, we can think about all the things we're going to use, and people aren't as in fear of. Now, you want to explain that, how fear works on these things when we know that we live, Richard and I teach about spirit, and we teach about life after life because we believe we're eternal immortals, and our spirit and soul are basically a spiritual being in a physical being as a vessel coming down here. So eternally, a lot of people are taught through world religions that we die, which they can see the body. And, you know, for eons and eons, we've known people's bodies can be left behind, burned up or whatever, but that doesn't say that your consciousness is. So Richard, how do we help with the dispelling or making life crossing over easier? Because I, the paranormal phenomena seems to be still in the hobbies category because most people can't make enough day-to-day uh, -to, -day to support food, clothing, and shelter, much less the tools it takes to be a paranormal investigator. But uh, there's two things there. One, we, we know we help others in the crossing over or cleaning or, uh, you know, owning spirits or helping spirits in some of these supernatural places where the energy has stayed behind. But it also, uh, some of it has to do with people dying and not knowing that they're dead and they cling to that reality. They don't know that they're dead. So there's a lot that we can discuss about near death experiences and out of body with Richard. Uh, Richard, walking in and out of walls, uh, a lot of this scares people, but is there a way you can make it sound better for those that are scared of the topic, first of all. We need to try to dispel uh, communicating with aliens versus communicating with angels. But uh, how do you want to introduce this? This is uh, a popular subject to some and others. Just... Can you help? Are you there? 
Can you hear me? Okay. I guess I'll have to call him back. So. All right. Well, let's see here. Place guest. Let's see, dial. Okay. Yes, I got, I don't know what happened. I got put on hold or something, and then all of a sudden, Blog Talk Radio said goodbye. So, who knows? It's a paranormal day, and all kinds of paranormal occurrences are happening. <laughs> so, anyway, to dispel, let us, let us begin by dispelling fear, okay? Fear is basically anything that the mind comes across that is unknown or foreign to it, okay? So, the human reaction is to basically get a revved up, uh, oh, nervous system and basically react um, very nervously and not want to really deal with it and so forth. And sometimes it's the flight or fight syndrome from a psychological standpoint. Well, there's no reason to fear anything because naturally we are all eternal beings, okay? And we are mortals in our spirits and what we use as a vessel here upon earth is purely basically our plaything, you could say, or basically it's the actor in the, in the scenario that we create around us. And that is also created around us in addition as a super, supreme consciousness as a race. So you've got two kinds of consciousness interacting here and there's no reason to, at all to be fearful because nothing in actuality can harm you. Now, yes, things can help, can harm your physical self, you know, if you get in bad neighborhoods or be at the wrong place at the right time or these kind of things. But as far as being afraid, you have to understand that fear itself is a negative state of being and a negative state of mind. And so just like anything else, like attracts like. So if you become fearful of a situation, say uh, you're about to go into what has been rumored to be a haunted place, okay? and you're afraid to go in, actually, you shouldn't even venture inside. The reason being that your greatest fears are very well going to take place inside that place that you've labeled as haunted, okay? So if you're expecting to see demons, or if you're expecting to see ghouls from hell, or if you're expecting to see zombies, or the walking dead, or encounter vampires, or encounter werewolves, or encounter shapeshifters, or encounter demons, or any of any of thousands of other semi some are semi negative and some are purely negative or dark entities that i can name and so if you're projecting positively you're not going to experience those rather you're going to be in a neutral state of mind and encounter that which is there as a residual energy or may be there because there are spirits that are hanging around because they're, they're they don't know that they're dead or they're hanging around because possibly they feel compelled to be there okay now, oftentimes, this, this kind of falls in a gray area simply because you have spirits that have already crossed over to the other side and then in turn returned back to the place they were last at in order to deliver a message to the living in regards to how they were murdered or possibly how they were mistreated. And once this story gets out and is spread around and other human beings are no, you know, make note of it and so forth, then in turn, uh, they leave. Okay, completely. So there is no, there's no reason to be afraid of spirits, and there's no reason to be afraid of the dark, or there's no reason to be afraid of the paranormal, simply because the paranormal is actually a part of your regular self. Okay? As spiritual beings, we have uh, physical bodies, we have mental bodies, we have emotional bodies, we have etheric bodies, we have astral bodies, we have light bodies, we have diamond bodies. And then we have our higher self, which you could say more or less is your direct conscious upliftment to the source of all that is, or God, okay? Now, when it comes to angels, okay, angels, of course, through history have interacted with mankind in lots of different ways. And most of the time, 98% of the time, it's always positive and always helpful, whether a person's being saved from dying during an accident, or maybe they're saved from dying uh, when they're being shot at or something of this nature, or perhaps a, a possible poisoning 
or maybe they're directed not to get on a certain plane that may in turn crash down the line, or maybe they're giving loose, they're given lucid dream instruction and shown what not to do in a particular traffic incident in visiting certain places. Maybe they should postpone their visits, all these kind of things. And these are all your spirit guides and your angelic helpers. Okay. And we all have a healing team. So there is absolutely nothing to really be afraid of other than fear itself. So I would disband all fear from the subject of either ghosts, the paranormal, spirits, or anything that in that falls within the supernatural category, because these are all events that we are tuned into as spiritual beings, okay? And these are the norm for us. These are not abnormal, but rather these are normal occurrences, and they occur more more uh, regularly on a, on the basis of your frequency and vibration that you put out. So if you're a positive person, okay, you're going to elucidate and bring to yourself all kinds of positive events. And at first it seems like a small trickle from a water faucet and a bunch of synchronicities that all seem to happen in a row. And then all of a sudden it starts branching out and the synchronicities start not only becoming places, but they also start becoming people. And this is how we say that you gather toward towards yourself, your spirit tribe, okay? And in regards to paranormal researchers and paranormal investigators, that's what they've done, okay? They have gravitated together and formed a team of individual like-minded persons, and they have the, the drive and the initiative and oftentimes the funding available to acquire all of these different uh, scientific machines and devices that can make recordings of spiritual entities that are actually haunting a given location. So there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of other than naturally that's going to be your human instinctive reaction to a given situation. Once you understand that and you understand that there's nothing to fear but fear itself, then in turn you can get over that fear and say, well, yeah, I'm going to be uneasy because I'm going into a place that I don't know, an environment that I haven't experienced before, but I'm also very protected because I am a spiritual being and not just a human being. And I think once you gain that understanding, things expand out rapidly for you and that fear drastically dissipates. On to you, TJ. Hello? TJ, are you there? Anyway, continuing on, I mean, I, ha I personally have uh, had all kinds of encounters of spiritual entities, okay, some of which were residual energy, which the, the way in which you denote a difference between a spiritual entity or a ghost as they're labeled, which I prefer to call them spirits rather than ghosts, um, residual energy has no consciousness. So in other words, it is like a recording that you're watching happen. In other words, at a certain time of day, a chair moves, or a certain time of day, the kitchen drawers open, or the closet door opens, and you get a picture possibly of a person moving around in this particular area, and they go through the same exact actions, and even though you're viewing them, and you may even get close to them, they make no conscious reaction to you whatsoever. They do not acknowledge that you are even there. That's what we specify as residual energy. Now, when a spirit is present and they consciously acknowledge that you are there, by, say, for example, when you're asking questions and recording uh, EVPs, um, then in turn, that is an intelligent spirit, and therefore, they are actually there in the same location with you, and they can inform you of what their desires are, or what their intentions are, or why they're possibly there, or exactly what is, you know, what, what's causing them to be there, and how you are recording them at the time, Okay. And then, of course, you move along farther down the path and you get into clearings and banishments and all of this kind of thing. And, of course, this I would recommend takes a bit of training because, again, you have to be very self-confident and very self-assured and very full of faith to perform these kind of rites or rituals. Okay? Hello? Hi. 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 <laughs> well, 
Let me call him back. I was talking for you, and, and nothing. I got no response. Okay. <laughs> and I mean, I gave a perfectly calm and very enlightening conversation and description in regards to fear and how to get away from fear and how to understand the paranormal and the supernatural and all of this. And I don't even know if it's recorded or not. Yeah, it's recorded. <laughs> Up till you got t- you got taken off when I came. Well, you have to merge me in again, I guess. I don't know what else to say. Either call me back or however you did it before. Uh, I can hear you. You're on. So I'm on. I'm on right now. You're on. Okay. This well, a, weird. This, yeah, this is a strange. Let me turn the uh, sound down on. But you're you can hear me right now, right, Richard? Yeah, I hear you very clearly. Very clearly. All right. Okay. Well, I so guess I'm giving re- the floor back over to you after my long, uh, you know, paraphrase of, or introduction as far as you know dealing with fear and how to get over it and all that kind of good stuff. Well, it says conference call, so uh, I guess. This is a new way we can do this. I tried to call in on the uh, connect number, so I know there's a host. I'm in, and, uh, you know, it's a shame on the weekend, but uh, years ago when I started with Blog Talk, they had people there during, you know, pretty much all the time, or they could be reached at their homes in New York, five or six girls. But the bigger company took over, Voxcast, bought Blog Talk, I believe. Let me look. But uh, for some reason, Voxcast um, owns – oh, now let me type. But uh, I guess it doesn't matter right now. The main thing is this is the first – I mean, like, show I've done paranormally or put that up there in a long, long time. Uh, but it seems that the paranormal existential – Research companies <laughs> all over, whether they're profit or nonprofit or private investigators or not, uh, there's some spooky stuff going on in electronics. But things, Richard, I've never seen or dealt with in eight years, nine. You, know, you said going on nine years, right? Yep. But uh, at the same time, there's so many people. Plus, this is Saturday, so it's pretty pretty busy, I guess, out there on the waves. But it wasn't. Uh, me kicking you off or anything i i just uh i'm looking at this one small little screen and now i've got to go back to the big screen and uh get us back where what's funny is we're being recorded but uh i've lost our train oh, of thought whether it's being broadcast or not thought. that's that's the question of course oh it is now well the paranormal the paranormal train of thought that we were last discussing is you had me introduce uh fear and anxiety in regards to the paranormal and the uh, supernatural and, you know, hauntings and these kind of things and to disband the fear generally in people and, of course, also explain where angels come in and, you know, I hadn't gotten to ETs yet, but um, I had basically given a very roundtable discussion in regards to, you know, not to be fearful because you're a greater being than you, than you actually accept yourself as being. And I know that's kind of double talk, but at the same time, um, we are spiritual beings having a human experience and not human beings running after a spiritual experience. And that's really a matter good. of perception. That's, yeah. that's a matter of perception and a matter of perspective. And of course we are each entitled to our own opinions. And of course we each form our own individual worlds. And that's what I was saying. You see, we are co-creators in that we form our own worlds, and our own worlds, of course, consist of our family, friends, teachers, peers, colleagues, uh, associates, uh, and all the various people and all the various places we go to as an interactive source. And then in turn, our world collides outwardly with the world at large, which has been created by the mass consciousness of the race, because we as a race agree consciously that we can make physical be- physical buildings. We agree that we make physical cities. We agree that we make lakes that are man-made. 
We agree that we make mountains that are man-made. We agree that we make ski resorts. We agree that we make all these various uh, theme parks and adventure parks and, and all these various places, and we are acknowledging them consciously as being real. But you also need to understand that from one perspective or from the grander plane of things, it is illusory because it's a holograph, because it's a conscious projection of our race upon the surface of the planet comfortable as human beings. And therefore, your little world, which in and of itself is quite intricate and quite unique and everything else, um, blends very easily into the overall world at large, and the two interact. And that's why I was saying it's a matter of perspective, because if you're a positive person, then you're going to draw to you everything that is positive. And it begins with synchronicities, and then all of a sudden friends and pe people come uh, out of the woodwork. And you form groups, and the groups of like-minded beings, you know, these, these individuals that are skilled in, in doing investigations and have all the tools and all this kind of thing, go out and, and conduct investigations in these haunted sites. And they have to be aware that they need to disband their own personal fear, because if they don't, then they're going to encounter anything that's negatively been told to them or anything that negatively resides in, say, their subconscious mind or the fear that they dwell in when they're in the dark or when they're frightened by something or something that is unexplained. So, in other words, if you project fear into a circumstance and into a, into a place, then in turn what you're going to get back is emanations of entities that may be dark or, fear, fear, or, or combined with fear that in turn would intimidate you and such. Whereas if you enter the place completely neutral with no idea whatsoever about what you're going to encounter, but at the same time protected, you cannot be harmed because you're protected, and you are more will willingly subjecting yourself to that environment and open-minded enough when you encounter a spirit or you encounter something occurring that, you know, you can record it and go on from there or have possibly intelligent conversations with, of course, have no physical bodies, even though there are what we call, um, oh, darn it, the, the, the term slipped my mind for a minute. But anyway, a complete uh, apparition, a full, a full body apparition of a spirit, which means that that spirit is gathering energy from you, gathering energy from the environment itself, and gathering energy from any electrical source surrounding it or any kind of frequency waves, whether they be radio, television, or otherwise, that are also surrounding it to boost it so that in turn it can at least give you the outline of a physical form that may appear to be uh, see-through, basically speaking. Now, of course, on rare events, there is individuals that have the ability to actually transpose themselves into that environment that you're visiting, and you actually almost see them and encounter them as another living being. But those are well, very extensively rare. Apparitions, because... Uh, it can be a strange image or creature that someone sees or even a very dark or unusual something, an apparition, a uh, phenomenal anomaly. But we've got unidentified anomalous phenomena as our group, UAP associates. But that also entails – mostly people think of it as UAVs uh, or UFOs. And at the same time, uh, we're getting into those that drive the UFOs, which is separate from MUFON, Mutual UFO Network, or Center for UFO Intelligence, although Jay Allen Heineck just asked me to help. But I didn't know I was going to cross over into paranormal apparitions, but near-death experiences too. So there can be ghostly apparitions and phantoms and uh, ghosts of people that have died and don't know they've died. And then those that got knocked out of their bodies unexpectedly, they can't cross over. And uh, let's, let's say people, you know, especially ghosts. We call those supernatural appearances uh, to be nice. We help them cross over if they're a ghostly apparition and don't know they've died. Now, some are called specters or phantoms, and that can be residual energy that doesn't have a full uh, diva or spiritual soul. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to get into some deep 
if we want to, um, pronunciation, deep meanings, and how others think, you know, uh, people just getting into this may not realize that some of the parapsychological aspects of doing investigations, which Richard and I have both come across as detectives and investigators, is the fact that, first of all, we have to go in and we're very empathic. And we have to uh, identify the haunting definition or the familiar because uh, – and a lot of us bring an animal, a familiar, a dog or a cat. But uh, the definition presence of something that you feel, especially if you're unusually empathic, and uh, I'm a precognition type of uh, precog feeling. But imaging uh, – a lot of people say headless or like ghost-like uh, are a zombie. They think of things they've seen on the movie, Richard. So the other part is uh, spirit people, uh, people from other planets. We have ghosts that are apparitions like clouds, and they're just energy. And uh, I've seen pictures that have been opened up out of portals, people opening up portals with you know, energy coming through, and some that looked as similar to fire smoke and we don't want to be fooled can you still hear me richard hey you're merged back. Mute button. I, I actually disconnected but anyway all right well we're back now folks uh i don't know this is going to be very interesting to go back and listen to i was talking about the difference in the apparition definitions and that there's ghosts that figure like a specter or phantom or somebody without a you know, like a headless figure, horseless figure and ghosts and things of Halloween. But then there's also those from fires and smoke and some we conjure ourselves. And then there's others that look like spirit beings. And some people call them, uh, they come out of the portals when we open them up with groups or the energy. And even uh, a lot of electrical engineers that have seen plasma uh, but in ghost-like figures, they say ghosts, phantom specters, wraith, shadows, spirits, emergence, visitations, appearance, manifestation. There's all kind of words that fall under the word apparition that you mentioned, Richard. But, uh, you know, uh, kids learn from what they see in movies and in books and read. And, you know, even when you're kids, there's fairy tales. And I never liked watching horror stories. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I did growing up as a kid, but as an adult, I make a choice not to, but my daughter has a whole bunch of them before she passed. She loved her. So it, it's some kind of energy that people like to watch, but, uh, can you tell me a doppelganger now? Can that be like your shadow? Because we have shadows that are white and we have shadows from the sun that can make shadow people but an apparition of a living person. But they say sometimes, now folks, you don't have to believe in this, but the, there's been a rise since 2018s of doppelgangers, of people swearing that other people look like them. And they uh, there's also a saying that there's a human that is a person or a, a replacement or clone called a doppelganger. There's even uh, right now people saying that uh, Biden has been replaced by a doppelganger. Are they made a clone like Hollywood? That uh, And I'm hearing that, folks. You can say it's a conspiracy theory or a ghostly counterpart of a living person, a doppelganger. So there's all kind of meetings that uh, have different biological uh, – how could I say this? They don't put it in phenomenology, parapsychology. Uh, we do cross over a lot in detective work and investigations and research with uh, carbon-based units, but also biologically unrelated lookalikes. Uh, and so it's getting a lot more complicated when we start unpacking ghost doubles. Uh, Richard, have you had any experience – other than mirror or shadow people in mirrors. Now, some of these people will cover the mirrors when they go in the houses in case there are lookalike doppelgangers that left the person and hid in the mirror. And these are from the 1800s. Uh, 
well, we'll have to go and research doppelganger, but for sure in the 19th century, that's a German word. But uh, yes, it re- literally, it means your double gear, your double energy. It's like your personality that you left in the mirror, and the soul uh, took its uh, flight from this reality into another dimension or passed on or crossed over. But the doppelganger remained in the mirror and then climbed out. And is in the house. <laughs> okay. So a lot of people put towels over the mirrors so uh, they won't have to chase their spooky doppelganger. <laughs> Those are the ones you see that are walking up and down the stairs of people from the old days, our little girls brushing their hair that were mean and threw a tantrum. And a lot of times they would create a doppelganger of their ego, but it was their anger self. Are the kids that were really mean are very famous for being in movies are right. going over in their dolls. I'm sure y'all have seen movies about the doppelganger dolls or the some people call them their ghosts. But there are lots of differences uh, that oh, we yeah. need to go into, uh, especially if you're going to start chasing doubles or ghosts of living people are uh, figuring out what type of entity or our energy, our essence that you are uh, working with in Supernatural. So, uh, Richard, have you ever watched Supernatural, the TV show with the Winchester b- brothers? Yes, I've been following it quite frequently, as a matter of fact, because it brings in all kinds of different realities and all kinds of different person, uh, persons and entities and dimensions and all kinds of different things. Um and- There's a lot to our Ace Folk Life, folks, because Ace Folk Life covers myths and legends, and uh, we've we've been together for years and years, and uh, we started in Kentucky, and now I'm the main headquarters here in Florida, but we work with the Smithsonian and different groups and different paranormal groups and supernatural and uh, phenomenology. But Supernatural TV show, uh, Richard, uh, I guess – you guys, there's a word called supernaturalism. Now, that is uh, believing in other otherworldly realms or realities in uh, one way or another associated. Now, they say it's commonly associated with religions, but I don't necessarily think that because most religions don't like to talk about ghosts or want to deal with death and dying. At the most, you know, they, a lot of them, uh, even – here where I live in the South, they won't do funerals. I mean, we were told we had to pay them extra to get my daughters. Uh, they said, well, we don't normally do funerals. And we had to talk them into it and pay them uh, and, you know, to do the funeral. So there's things about death and dying, even for religion and, and, re, and the, the churches. The church is the people. So I should say the building, right? The building and the people that run the building that say they have the – uh, non-formed religion in the building, but those can be haunted too. And my daughter's church was. She painted it, and there was a ghost. I think, Richard, I told you about that. Yeah. So, oh, my goodness. Oh, that's a scam call, it says. So okay. uh, super, supernaturalism, a belief in otherworldly realms or reality. So I would suggest that other realms exist. And that there are things that are in this world that we don't want to deal with. But now we are starting to deal with them uh, in uh, documentaries, television shows, and the supernatural. So, Richard, are, is there anything lately that you can comes to mind of topics that you could talk about that were on the TV show? Uh, or you want to get into that, portraying some I'm- kind of – I don't know if I really want to get into the TV show because now you're involving Hollywood and it involves special effects. And there are some things that are portrayed that are authentic, and there's a great many things that are portrayed that are not authentic. Okay. Now, as far as religious teachings um, and as regards to the subject of death or dying, magic, and all of that, you have to understand that there are two sides to each and every religious body as far as you know the Catholics and the rest of the, the Christian faiths that basically they have an outward projected school and they have an inward projected school. So naturally, you know, anyone who's been ordained as a priest is given a great deal more 
joint training and teaching in regards to the supernatural, in regards to angels and different beings and entities of different forms uh, at different levels and dimensions and so forth that, like you said, is deliberately withheld from the public and not projected outwardly because, um, and I'm, I don't mean this in a negative way, but the fact of the matter speaks for itself historically, um, massive religions around the world reach out and to a large degree control mentally and emotionally those who decide that they want to follow that path in regards to that tradition, okay? And as a result of that, um, they don't want to bring into the conversation or the relationship anything that would provide fear because fear in turn would turn the audience away from the person speaking, okay? Whether it be a, a priest behind a pulpit or a priest holding mass or whatever. And I mean, even mass and all of these rites, they are in fact rituals and they do invoke the Holy Spirit, which is supposed to be part of the Trinity that makes up God the Father, God the Son, and God, and, and God the Holy Spirit. So, you know, as far as religion is concerned, yes, there are overtones of religion uh, portrayed in supernatural because, frankly speaking, the, Christ, the Christian church created the devil. Until the Christian church was created, there was no devil. As far as the old religions going back historically, such as witchcraft and druidism and uh, pagan faiths and pe pagan religions, there was no devil. There was no hell. There was no um, signing of pacts with blood between yourself and, and demonic entities or the, or the devil's hierarchy and all this kind of thing. Those are purely of religious substantiation and a religious creation in actuality. And you add the public in general as a conception of what their understanding or what their perception and acceptance of these different things are. And you expand out a long ways because – You've got people, like you said, completely involved in supernaturalism or paranormalism or any of these given topics taken to a finite extreme where there is not only research created and research undertaken, but uh, it is absolutely devoid of any fear or devoid of – to sometimes it's, it's completely underwritten by science, and at other times it's completely devoid of science. Again, depending on the perception and perspective that the individual is pursuing. But supernatural as a program um, indicates that, yes, there are angels that can, want, that can and do walk among us, for one thing. There are devils and demons that do, in fact, walk among us, for a second thing. There are other entities, such as grand witches and sorceresses and all of these other personas that do, in fact, walk among us, okay? And, of course... There are also dark entities that really cannot be described that the Winchester brothers encounter on a regular basis and do battle with. And, of course, they have special tools like uh, guns that shoot demons and uh, crossbows that kill demons. And uh, there are special swords and special knives and all of these kind of things. And then it even goes farther and deeper into it by suggesting that both brothers at one time or another – have either been possessed by a demon entity or been possessed by Lucifer themselves and even brought into a cage on a different dimension with Luther, Lucifer himself. And all kinds of different pacts were undertaken or all kinds of agreements or, or of some kind were signed or installed so that in turn it per permeates their essence or their being even on a physical realm. And of course, they do battle with vampires they do battle with werewolves. They do uh, battle with uh, uh, all kinds of entities that are pulled from mythic lore, such as chupacabras or uh, other beings that are a mixture of different animal forms all in one being and uh, all of this kind of thing. And, of course, they also deal with spirits, and they also deal with uh, shadow figures, and they also deal with all kinds of rites that are mystical and magical in regards to compelling uh, spirit entities such as the devil or his henchmen, per se, to remain in a circle and cannot leave that circle until eventually the circle gets weakened because the faith of the persons involved in it, either their faith weakens or the candles go out or something of that nature, which in turn would create a vortex from which they can escape the bound area that they were bound in to begin with. 
course, you know, they, they do all kinds of investigations of all kinds of horrendous murders that have transpired. And the murders themselves are supernatural from the aspect being that the murder was happened because uh, that individual had an encounter with an entity that was not human. So, yeah, Supernatural pans the whole gamut. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very good variety show. I like it, and I follow it pretty much uh, extensively. And, of course, a lot of times it makes me laugh because I am very well schooled in the initiatory arts and practice magic in many different eclectic forms and, you know, uh, look upon religion as a theologian, as one who has studied divinity and one who studied religious science, uh, and then compact all of that together with spirituality and metaphysics on top of it. So, yes, I am my eye as I perceive the, the show is you know, quite a different perspective than the average viewer, which I'm sure the average viewer finds it very entertaining. And, of course, there have been other shows about witches and witchcraft, okay? And there are there's a great series on right now, Ford or The Witches Ordinaire or something of that nature anyway, and that show actually portrays a lot of witches' abilities that are factual and not fancy. Granted, they are hyperextended because of uh, uh, what you would call um, – special effects, but at the same time, the actual abilities themselves in the raw, not only do they exist, but they are utilized on a daily basis by witches and sorcerers and magicians and, and peoples of the occult nature or who study secret things, since the word occult only means secretive or the secret, okay? Um, so now, if you open the, the complete textbook open in regards to entities, my take on doppelgangers is a little bit different than yours, um, simply because I have been told by family members that, in fact, I do have a physical spitting image of my physical form running around in London, similarly the same age as I, and have a very, very similar look to them as I do. So this is an actual uh, doppelganger trend tradition that says that everyone has a lookalike in the world. So that would imply that possibly our spirits are actually controlling two bodies instead of just one. So we may well be uh, multifaceted from the aspect being that our incarnation may have been split into several bodies when we actually incarnated upon the earth. Now, I know that's a very deep and very far out thing to say, but that's, again, another take on doppelgangers. And regards to the mirrors being covered after someone has passed, um, traditionally from Sicilian aspect and Italian aspect, that was done to prevent the spirit from crossing back through the mirror and terrorizing their relatives if their relatives happened to have harmed them or done bad to them in some way, shape, or form. So the mirrors were covered so the mirrors could not be used as a portal or gateway to enter from the other side, which is a crossing over situation because I call it the other side, which is where everybody goes. Once you die or leave your body behind, you go to the other side, and from that platform, you decide whether, in fact, you need to reincarnate there again or not. Um, well, doppelganger, I can give you as an apparition or double of a living person. Now, according to Wikipedia, and I'll give you Merriam-Webster, too, but, well, I'll do Merriam-Webster first. It says, a ghostly counterpart of a living person, a person who closely resembles another living person, B, and then the opposite side of a personality, and then alter ego is C, a person who has the name, same name as another. Now, so there's three different ways. Then Wikipedia says a doppelganger is a biologically unrelated lookalike or right. a double of a living exactly. person. But right. it also says in fiction and mythology, a doppelganger is often portrayed as a ghostly are paranormal phenomenon and usually seen as a harbinger of bad luck. Other traditions and stories equate a doppelganger with an evil twin. So there's a lot of different things that we may not have known before this show that we would have looked like because I've often thought of a doppelganger just as, oh, that's your lookalike. But no, there are ghostly counterparts and those that some are living people that look alike, but they're not related, or so they biologically think they're not related. But in fiction, you can have words that we learn in TV and movies that uh, relate to quite a different meaning. 
So, you know, when we talk about words and what we think we know, it really depends on the person and their opinion and their filters. So a ghostly double part or counterpart says uh, doppelganger definition in Cambridge. Let me see what this one, because Cambridge is well thought of. It says a spirit that looks exactly like a living person, someone who looks exactly like someone else but who is not related. But that's that's odd because Cambridge is usually pretty good, but they don't give a very deep meaning. I think, right. uh, But I think Wikipedia had a much nicer uh, – so, you know, it just depends, too, on your dictionary, doesn't it, when you're looking up a definition, which is something we need to think about, folks, when we're using cyberspace culture and uh, all our supernatural abilities of thinking what we know. Maybe the person you're talking to about doppelganger, so make sure, well, what, which meaning are we referring to? Like Richard said, I may have a different meaning, right? <laughs> well, you know, I have a different opinion simply because it's been proposed to me that, in fact, there is a twin that looks identical to me that is alive and living in England. Well, that's And they know this be... because they've seen pictures of me and compared it to the actual person that is alive and well in England that is actually a cousin by blood. So they are related, but it may be a very distant cousin. I mean, it could be a third or fourth cousin or a fifth cousin twice removed or something. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times people will skip one generation and the next generation will get uh, cousins that look alike too. So that's just the word D O P P E L G A N G E R doppelganger. But uh, right. you can go into a whole show, a whole two hours, just on discussing the effects of doppelgangers and the different meanings, and even the meanings that are in cyberspace by Cambridge uh, and different uh, Wikipedia, uh, looking at dictionaries and what they Harvard. mean, and yep. witches and supernatural, and uh, the best witch TV shows. Uh, folks, I don't know if you're familiar with Rotten Tomatoes, which is a strange name, but uh, Rotten Tomatoes is like they give uh, stars and they uh, have editorial interviews and guides on what's on TV. Uh, you can look at that, but they'll show you different TV and things. The best witch TV shows and the worst. So they have the worst witch show and the best. So you remember Hex are the worst witch, but Sabrina, Dark Shadows, Good Witch, Bitten, Eastwick, Emerald City, Witches of East End, True Blood, all these names, Charmed is number 18. Shadowhunters is ahead of that, 17. Once Upon yep. a Time, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I like that show. Salem, Merlin. Ooh, I liked Merlin. Uh, these are the kind of shows I like, but I don't consider them scary. Now, when you get on down, they had the adventures of Sabrina. Then Originals was nine about the vampires. So the Vampire Diaries beat that out. Then Grimm is six. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones? How did that get in there? All right, but that's number five. Penny Dreadful's four. Asheville something. I don't I didn't even see that. Ash Evil Dead, 2015. Number three, I missed that one. The Adams Family, I saw that. Number two, and the Discovery of Witches, which you were talking about, yes, is number that's the one. one. That's the one that's, that's eight, very much. It that's the one very eight. much real to life. <laughs> it says a Discovery of Witches was made in 2018. It only had two uh, ep, uh, two years, I guess you might say, two in a series. Uh, so uh, people say – I could never remember the name of that show. So I wonder what it is. Uh, people, uh, It's been on since 2018 and off again. So uh, people say they have trouble because they put that A, Discovery of Witches, and you even had trouble, and I did too. So there's something about many words are the A, Discovery. It says a contemporary love story that begins against the backdrop of Oxford account – Academic life where the their numbers. Let me see. I've got to go to the next page, y'all. You know how it says more Rotten Tomatoes. That's where I'm getting this from. For more details, if you want to go to Rotten, it's easy to remember that one. I can remember, but a discovery of witches, I couldn't. 
So it says uh, episode seven of Discovery of Wishing, season two, episode seven. So if it only started in 18, how do they do their episodes uh, every year? You know, this is something that Pence, I guess, we're going to have to look that up because we've got our ninth year, Richard and I are starting. So a Discovery of Witches videos. We'll have to watch those, folks. It says TV Network AMC. It premiered April 7th, 2019 under science fiction and fantasy genre. And uh, Jane Tranter is the producer. But uh, did you see an episode or something of that, yes. Richard? Yes, I, I actually seen? caught three episodes of that so far. And they are very sporadic in the way that AMC plays them or introduces them. It's like, uh, you know, maybe they put on three shows per month or something. I don't know because I've been watching AMC's board as far as the television broadcasts, um, and it, it just isn't listed. So, you know, when I go through my, t- my TV guide, uh, you know, my channel guide on my TV, of course, I'm always looking along the lines of AMC because if I remember right, it was, it was around 10 o'clock or later at night on which they put these programs. The reason being that they don't want children perspectively to naturally be uh, subjected to these shows. Rather, they prefer an adult audience. Um, but yeah, well, that one is that one's one. very, very, very good and very, very authentic. It has uh, special effects in it to the degree that they need to be there um, in order so that people would understand exactly what's going on. But it is very authentic in a lot of ways. And it's very interesting because, you see, witchcraft has been down, downgraded and uh, ever since the time of Salem, where all the witch burnings happened, when in actuality, in reality itself, there were no witches burned whatsoever, rather because of a rye complex that disintegrated and turned into a semi-hallucinogenic compound. All of these town of Salem were actually hallucinating and believing things that were happening that were actually not happening at all. So as a result, a lot of very innocent people got accused of being witches, and some of them were hanged, and some of them were burned, and some of them were drowned. Well, the thing of it is, is this, okay? In the pagan community, witches have been around for thousands of years and continue to be around for thousands of more years. Why? Because uh, you cannot stamp out something that is um, self-propagating, okay? Because witches are created generationally in family lines. Uh, I mean, my uh, the, the witchcraft, hereditary uh, druidism, and so forth that I have in, in the nine clans that represent my family line go back over 5,000 years. And again, you see, magic to us is perfectly normal. Um, watching horror movies and supernatural movies and even extraterrestrials and things are not scary to us because – we are aware and open and receptive, grander reality than others might well want to allow in. And that may also be another cause of fear, because if you're not open-minded enough to allow in the possibility of different circumstances or situations, then in turn, when you encounter them, you're going to be instantly fearful. Now, I can give you a couple of examples of uh, two hauntings that I personally experienced uh one when i was 15 years old i had gone to the outskirts of san jose california and this is a wooded area that has a very nice river that runs through it and the river eventually turns into a very nice stream and this is kind of a picnic area where you can go during the daytime with your family and friends and all have picnics and all that kind of social life well anyway my friends and i had gone there basically just to chill out and to have conversations and socialize and be away from the normal neighborhoods in the city because it's out in nature. Well, we got out the car, and I happened to wander off by myself. And as I did so, I was following the stream, and this happened to be a weekend just like Saturday is today, only it happened to be about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, okay? And all of a sudden, I am my the side, the side uh, vision of my eyes are all of a sudden drawn to movement in the distance. So naturally, being drawn to movement, I start focusing my regular vision upon what's in front of me, and I do see, in fact, a woman that appears to be clad in robes, okay? 
and something out of like the 1950s or not 1940s, 1950s, somewhere in that area or era of, of dress and so forth. And she is coming along the stream and she is calling out a name. Okay. And uh, the name, I believe, if I recall, Andrea or something like that. And she is addressing what she is perceiving as a young daughter that evidently had gotten lost from her immediate vicinity. And she is going, going traipsing up and down this, this stream and even up to the, the, the juncture of the river in hopes of finding her daughter. Okay. And this is not quite a full body apparition, but at the same time, it's like three quarter body apparition because you're seeing everything about this woman except for her feet. In other words, she appears to be floating in air with not, without the necessity of having feet. And she just kind of floats from one side of the stream to the other, and she's calling out. Now, when I reached out to her intuitively, there was no response whatsoever. So this is a fine example of what you would call residual energy. In other words, a tragedy happened where this woman lost, this, lost her daughter. And when I researched the names and looked back in history, back around the um, – late 1800s, early 1900s, around the 20s and 30s, and on into the 40s and 50s, there had actually been a woman that lost a child, a female child named Andrea, who was only about a year and a half old, and unfortunately, her daughter drowned in that particular river and stream, and so therefore, you could say that because there was a separation of the child going crossing over first, when in fact the mother crossed over at a later date, her spirit kept look her her residual energy formed back into the space that was the river of the stream where her daughter had drowned, and she was this apparition was appearing when in actuality it was only the residual energy of something that happened fifty sixty years earlier. Now, that was one particular it's an example of an apparition that was full body for the most part, other than there were no feet, feet apparent. You know, there were no, the bottom part of her legs and feet weren't apparent because she was obviously just float, floating along as an apparition and not actually appearing full body in regards to making actual contact with the ground. But, I mean, that goes to show you, you see, when a severe trauma of some kind occurs that is emotionally disturbing – between two parties, that is what oftentimes creates residual energy in the atmosphere or the ethers, you could say. And those of us that are sensitive and perceptive of these kind of entities and these kinds of occurrences do actually see them as occurring. Now, of course, none of my friends could see this. I went and got my friends and said, well, you know, will you take a look over here? And they looked and no, they couldn't see the lady and they couldn't hear the, vo the voice of the lady or any of that. Okay. And, of course, as soon as I left the immediate area, she ceased to exist. So, again, you see, residual energy usually transpires certain acts at a certain time in a certain place, and there is no intelligence or conscious awareness in the apparition that you are encountering. And you can reach out to them either mentally, you can call out to them physically, verbally. It doesn't make a difference. You will get absolutely no response from them. And that's what is the big difference in dividing what we would call a ghost or spirit and just an apparition. An apparition of residual energy has no conscious awareness and therefore only is doing what it has done in the past and just repeating those same actions. And you cannot talk to it. It will not acknowledge you are there or anything else. But when you come to a spirit, now that's an entirely different ballgame, okay, because they could be – present because they are confused and unaware that they died. They could be present because they have become trapped by a sinister spirit that is actually trying to hold on to their spiritual energy and keep them trapped in, say, uh, asylum situations or uh, situations of this nature where a great deal of murder and a great deal of travesty of justice has occurred and a great deal of abuse and a great deal of torture, such as prisons and insane asylums and oftentimes even some hospitals. Um, Waverly, for example, um, is a fine example of a hospital that began as a hospital and then in turn ended up becoming a place where the, those that were uh, dropped off and left to be cared for because the families didn't want them because maybe they were autistic as children 
or maybe there was something wrong with them mentally as far as their development. Maybe their development froze. And so you have this influx of a great deal of children amongst adults who are there because they're not in touch mentally with reality. Instead, they're kind of living in, in their own little twilight zone, you could say. And then, of course, you have the physical beings that are there, such as the nurses and the doctors. And sometimes you have you interject like uh, frontal lobe removal, uh, shock treatment induced into water when they're in bathtubs and such, or uh, all kinds of different torture systems, which we would consider to be torture. But in that day, they considered as being on the cutting edge of medicine at the time in regards to helping these individuals that obviously you could not make verbal, emotional, or mental contact with because they could not be reached on a regular scale. So, Let and me then use you, your filters on the topic of spirit. Let me give you some ideas of uh, the differences in these definitions like we did on the last topic. So spirit, well, sure. right? Yeah. There's a spirit for uh, alcohol, uh, spirit chemistry, oh, spirit yeah, of religion. Course. But it says uh, there's a few dictionaries that will use the Internet part in cyberspace culture. The non-physical part of a person, which is the seat of emotions and character, the soul we seek a harmony between body and spirit. Now, I'm just going to give you guys some of this to look at because of what we're talking about and following us and working with us. Those qualities regarding as forming the definitive are typical elements in the character of a person nation or group or in a thought and attitudes of a particular period like the university spirit our stolen cows were spirited away now here's another by merriam webster says now all these different ones will mean different i guess they do that intentionally because they have their brand cambridge merriam webster or just dictionary you know and wikipedia but uh this is merriam webster an animated Mating are vital principle held to give life to physical organisms, a supernatural being or essence, such as capitalized Holy Spirit, soul sense, or an often benevolent being that is embodies is bodiless but can become visible, specifically ghost sense. Now here's Cambridge, uh, meanings of spirit in English. Spirit noun, spirit enthusiasm, spirit alcohol. Oh, this is just a short vision on Google, so let me just go to the next one. Uh, Spirit dictionary is uh, the principle of conscious life, the vital principle in humans, animating the body or mediating between body and soul. Now, these are just the short ones on each vocabulary dictionary. It says, spirit, if someone tells you you have a sagging spirit, That means your life force seems to be missing. (laughs) Spirit comes from the Latin word for breath, blah, blah, blah. Collins Dictionary, your spirit is the part of you that is non-physical, that consists of your character and feelings. Let's see, Wikipedia, the word spirit came into Middle Ages versus Old French. Its sources is Latin spiritus, so spiritus, which original meaning was breath or breathing breathing and hence spirit so uh you know these are just a few folks of the definition of afterlife or attitude towards life or to other people now this one mcmillan says it's your mood or attitude enthusiastic determining spirit so a term used to mean different things to different people to different cultures is what the free dictionary says it may mean the independent part of a person that survives after death but in magic let me see where it said the Holy Spirit spirit also found in thesaurus no I don't want to do it angel or demon here we go under Holy Spirit a force of principle believed to animate living beings a force or principle believed to animate humans <laughs> and often to endure it after departing from the body of a person at death and then it says the soul then it has spirit the Holy Spirit and then supernatural, uh, isn't that interesting how they separate this? These are one, two, and three. Under supernatural three, because I just gave you spirit, the Holy Spirit's number two. The first one was a force of principle believed to animate. Now three is a supernatural being as A, an angel or demon, B, a being 
inhabited or embodying, embodying a particular place, object, or natural phenomenon, or see a fairy or sprite. Oh, they've got a number four on this one. My goodness, this is good. Uh, four is the part of a human associated with the mind, will, and feelings. And then B, the essential nature of a person or group. And then five, a character characterized by a stated quality, such as he is a proud spirit. And then uh, a pervasive or essential attitude, quality, or principle, spirits, a mood, or emotional state. So I guess how you use it and what you mean for, because it also lists spirits like beverages, alcoholic, distilled liquors. And around here in the South, they will say, uh, if you drink those spirits, you may get an evil spirit. And then some people say they drink and they people can see demons in people when they get out of their minds. Are they they're acting crazy because they've been drinking and they don't know what they're doing or saying? They uh now let's talk about that, alcohol, because Richard, I know you or I may have had one on uh maybe Saint Patrick's Day coming up, right? <laughs> but let's say drinking a spirit what is it that people get out of control? And do you think that spirits can take over somebody that has just gotten totally drunk? Because that's some of the old sayings in the myths in Ace Folk Life or, you know, in the Ascension Center Education. People that get, some can get sweet and drunk and want to go to sleep and not bother you, and others can get mean and drunk. And I've heard in the old folks, me growing up, talking about that person got a mean spirit. And then just here recently, there were some people here that got drunk and on the weekends. They think they can, you know, go out Monday through Friday, even during the, uh, they work, but on the weekends, they like to hang out and get drunk. But one of them said, no, he can't drink. He gets a mean, he gets mean spirited. And uh, I know up in the Kentucky, when they drink, sometimes they'd watch them act out. Uh, you know, some of them would get a, a spirit. So there's different meanings. Do you yep. understand? What would you say about the emotions and the moods people get? Well, okay. First, let's consider drink. that. First, let's consider that alcohol is a depressant. So, in other words, if you're trying to avoid something like a bad situation, or you're trying to put a bad situation that's occurred to you out of your mind, you're going to have the affinity to drink simply because it allows your mind to disassociate from whatever that emotional state of being you were in before you had that drink. Now, I, I have actually seen and witnessed three categories of drunks. You got the happy drunk, you got the mean drunk, and you got the drunk that actually just becomes so pervasively aroused that they're trying to hang all over everybody. And, of course, this is very annoying, needless to say. But uh, And then, of course, it's also said, and I've actually experienced this once because I lived in New Orleans for 10 years, and New Orleans has the bars open 24-7, although from what I'm understanding now that they have curtailed it to some extent, not completely, but to some extent, where the bars actually are closing at 2 or 3 a.m. and not opening again until 7 or 8 in the morning. They're no longer opening them completely for 24-7, which they used to do. Because, I mean, I could walk out and be on my way to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and the bars would be rinsing themselves down with a hose, and whatever patrons were in there were asked to leave, and the patrons would go outside and maybe meander down 100 or 200 feet away and wait for the bars to completely hose themselves out in order to get rid of all the spilled alcohol that may be on the floor or any vomit that might, might where people may have gotten sick in the bar or anything else and just completely hose them clean. And then, of course, a few minutes later, they reopened for business, and these same alcoholics would go right back in the bar and continue drinking. Now, it is said that you can actually drink yourself sober. And I did actually experience this once. I began drinking at about 8 o'clock in the evening, and I didn't finish drinking until 8 a.m. that next morning. And at that time, I was completely sober, as though I had not had a drink at all. But again, like anything else, uh, people are very different in their constitution. They're very different in their chemical makeup. They're very different in their genetic makeup. They're very different in their DNA. There are all kinds of different uh, anomalies and abnormalities that can be combined in making a person. Now, of course, mood has a great, uh, a great influence in this 
because if you're happy and you're celebrating, say you just got a raise or you're celebrating because it's your birthday or you're celebrating because, you know, uh, you just won some money or, uh, you know, some other happy occurrence occurred in your life, then when you drink, you are going to be co- continue to be happy and you're going to be sociable and you're going to be very happy in mood. However, if the exact opposite has happened, okay, and let's say you just got fired or your girlfriend just dumped you or your parents just threw you out of the house or uh, some other extreme traumatic emotional event, when you start drinking, what happens is the drink allows all your emotions to come readily to the surface. So if you get drunk and you're, and you're already mad because of something that bad has happened to you, then in turn you're going to be a mean drunk. You know, another extreme, of course, like I said previously, you know, if you're lascivious by nature and you get drunk, then, of course, you're going to be uh, more outgoing and more um, lewd to some extent than you would normally. And they say, of course, that drinking basically brings out the true character of the person that often resides behind a mask on a daily basis that they don't allow others to see. So, I mean, you know, and of course, uh, fire water has been the undoing to the uh, Native American cultures and civilizations simply because they had never had alcohol prior to the point that, the you know, Western cavalry and everybody else started introducing it to them. And as a result, they have had a, uh, a spurge of alcoholism amongst the, a great many Native American tribes and so forth. So that's been a very, very large downside as far as the spread of alcohol is concerned. Now, of course, we all join together and toast for New Year's Eve. However, I quit doing that uh, tradition about 10 or so years ago simply because I got to thinking, well, if whatever actions you do on the very eve of the new year are going to follow forward into that new year. So who the heck would want to be drunk? on the first day of the new year, because that would propose that perhaps you're going to have a lot of drunken occasions throughout the new year as it spreads before you. However, if you're in a happy social situation and you're amongst friends and you're sharing food and you may be drinking as a toast when, you know, the ball drops or whatever the situation is, um, of course, in the Eastern time zone, we get the, the new year faster than the rest of the country simply because The four time zones in the country uh, are followed by, you know, Eastern first, then uh, and then Mountain, and then, of course, Western or Pacific. So you're talking about a division of one hour at first, then two hours at first, and then followed by three hours last. So, I mean, you know, I call and talk to my relatives on the West Coast, and, of course, to me, it's already New Year's, and they yet are yet to have another two and a half hours before New Year falls. So... But, I mean, yes, in St. Patty's Day and other celebratory holidays, you know, people do have a tendency to take a nip, as I like to say. And, you know, depending, of course, on what mood it is that you're in and also depending on how much self-governance or self-control you have also determines how drunk you become. I mean, some people, I used to sit in a bar and spend, you know, six or eight hours in a bar and I would drink three drinks in that entire six to eight hours because why? I would be sipping the drink. And I would also interpose, you know, like juices or just plain Cokes or other beverages that were plain and had no alcohol in them before going back and take another sip of the actual drink. You can do this with rum and you can do this with whiskey and you can do this with vodka and you can do this with a, a plethora of other alcoholic substances. But drinking, of course, um, unfortunately, is one of the largest causes of death as well in the country simply because people go out and get drunk. And then they decide to get behind the wheel, and they're no longer conscious of what they're doing, and their reaction speeds while they're driving are not what they should be, and they end up colliding head-on with other vehicles, killing the other driver, or sometimes they run people over, and all kinds of drastic tragedies. So, yes, um, you know, alcohol, like any other tool, you could say, it can be used to lift your spirit, to lower your spirit, or allow you to escape from a difficult situation that you don't want to face. And again, that's that's just my humble opinion and experience and, and perspective because, you know, I've been around alcoholics. Uh, I had an uncle that was an alcoholic. 
Um, it did eventually kill him with by cirrhosis of the liver, um, which is a hardening of the liver, by the way. And, uh, you know, uh, there are people that are what you call social drunks that can sit here and drink the majority of the day, and their persona doesn't really change. Instead, they're just the happy-go-lucky and social person they were before they began because they have driven – they have gotten to such a point that they have derived an immunity in a manner of speaking to the alcohol itself. So it becomes like a tradition more than an actual physical effect to some extent. But again, you know, and, and of course, spirits, um, like you said and demonstrated, TJ, with all the various dictionaries, uh, of course, the spirit that I was uh, making you know, reference to is the spirit that controls us. It's the essence of energy and consciousness that pervades our human self, that once it leaves our human self, the human body dies. And those are the spirits that in turn oftentimes haunt other locations and are in turn oftentimes seen uh, on bar- boardwalks, uh, sometimes uh, across rivers, sometimes across spillways, sometimes in schools, sometimes in churches, and so on and so forth. And some of them, like you say, you know, are conscious and some of them are not. Well, let's and talk again, about, we've got about 20 minutes left. Okay. Let's talk about near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences because there's a lot of out there. Raymond Moody wrote a book and made uh, out-of-body experience, I think, or no, near, near-death near experiences. Which one yeah. did he make famous? I think it was near-death. NDEs, maybe? Yeah, uh, I think it was near-death. Now, Dr. I personally, I personally can speak directly from uh, experience, experience simply because I've had about nine or ten NDEs or near-death experiences, and I have also actually died and was legally dead for 33 minutes and came back into the body, having basically gone to the other side or what you would call a doorway or gateway between ourselves, crossing over in total, where I was met with what I perceived to be the form of God. And God basically showed me the book of life and said, me, told me in no uncertain terms, there were lots of things you agreed to do. You have not done them yet, so you have to go back. I've been sitting so, back too. I didn't know. So both of us have had near-death experiences out of body. So well, this is something we'll have to go in great detail in some of our classes. But uh, for the radio show purposes, OBEs or out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, there's been a lot of books, but... Dr. Raymond Moody was, uh, I think, the one that really got it out there talking about it. But now this different, but we have people. We can start, uh, you know, people that are on their truth-seeking as light workers and truth-seekers. A lot of them have had no uh, explanation, but we know there's life after death, and we know, of course, we have to take their word for it, right, like you and me sharing our experiences, which I wouldn't do for years and years. It's only been since I started radio. I I was scared to discuss my UFO ET experiences, and uh, I started just doing it for Dirk Vanderplug in Canada when he died, but uh, so did Kevin Smith on his radio show, and he died. But then Janet and Tommy and I started this, and we would talk about different topics for the last eight years. But with you and me, this will be a whole new experience because we'll be able to uh, help each other, and we should put ours in a book. I've got one coming up, Kendall, I'd like you to help me with, and you agreed with Dr. Richard Allen Miller because we're doing another level, or maybe it's the same, I don't know, but there's still no answers, just like for cancer. There's no answer for cancer, supposedly, allegedly yet. Then also uh, their neuroscience level with Dr. Bruce Lipton, and as you and I talked about, beta, alpha, theta, delta, gamma, uh, Dow, T-A-U, which he says is sixth, and then seventh for the levels of consciousness. But near-death experience, I don't know if how there's uh, all these years, I haven't really done research on that. I've just been being me and, you know, talking, but not really in depth. So we should do that. On the near-death out-of-body, now let me look at, uh, while you're talking about your near NDEs, near death experiences. I'll look up what they say these days because I'll have well, to get back into the swing of research. There's legally a great deal of there's legally a great deal of difference, okay, between a person that has actually died and left their body entirely and been legally pronounced dead 
and having a tag on their toe or being having a tag being put on their toe, okay, that announces who they are and the time of do- the time that they actually die. That is not yeah, a near death people. experience. That is that is actually dying tag. and coming back. Yeah. Well, so that was dying me. Dying and coming back, transition, right. death, life after life, or life. Uh, there's a, they're breaking it down with the brain these days, but I don't know that anybody scientifically has got it. Now they also compare DMT models, dimethyltryptamine, right, with complex yeah. uh, subjects and psychedelic experiences, but I don't think that's really the same thing either, unless it's been distressed no. near death experiences. So these are things we can really break down in what happens. There's life after life and what happens after we die and people telling their true stories. So Richard and I both have several stories. So about now, mine was at uh, second grade and I left my body due to hepatitis. So mine, let's look at how we could qualify this in our books. So for near death, mine was as a child out of body sitting aside and then seeing angels in the corner or two beings of gold light talking to me. Then when I had my daughter, Placenta Previa, that's number two. So uh, I had her and I lost all the blood in my body. So the fourth child, they cut me open and I came up the top of my head and saw looked down on myself. And then I went speeding off up into heaven or through all those stars and all of that. That's a really good one all the way up and see gold people. And then when my husband died, I died again and saw gold people. So uh, I haven't John, you haven't heard my near death experiences. So you want to just touch on some of yours like that. And then we'll go back and listen and grab them and put them in books, the details, but get okay, just run well, over yours. Well, like you, my first one occurred, I believe I was about seven years old. And I was in a chemistry class at a, at a uh, public school, and there were all kinds of uh, demonstrations of different elements, and they were portrayed. The actual elements themselves were like attached to a small slat of cardboard. Cardboard was labeled as to what it, the element was and all this kind of thing. And a couple of uh, my friends dared me to taste a particular element. Well, unbeknownst to me, I went ahead and grabbed the element on the piece of cardboard that it was on, and I went ahead, went ahead and licked it several times, and upon like the last lick, I immediately passed out, and they rushed me to the hospital because I'd been poisoned. Hey. So during that so during that near NDE, I basically saw them revive – I was watching from above and watching them revive my, my body by putting a tube down my throat and pumping out all the contents of my stomach and then in turn reviving me with all kinds of antibiotics and also also kind of, uh, uh, you know, salt water, uh, IVs, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, as that occurred, I then went, went into what you would call like, um, I don't know, a, a kind of like a gray space pernition of the space itself. Other than like you, I encountered angels and beings of higher light form and this kind of thing. And they basically were calm, calming me down and assuring me that everything would be okay and that I would be able to go back to my body sh- shortly thereafter. Then, of course, uh, transiting past that, well, I mean, the very first one, of course, happened when I was six months old and uh, my mother tried to drown me in the ocean by throwing me in the ocean. Now, yes, I did succumb to a great deal of salt water. However, I that was more of a supernatural um, occurrence, more so than an NDE, simply because a, be, a woman of uh, being of light pulled me from the water and put placed me back in my mother's arms, who had thrown me down into the water from the pier. So that that's not so much an NDE, other than the fact that that was a deliberate attempt at drowning me as a, as a given individual, as a given child. Okay. Oh, I so remember about drowning one too in the big pool. I've talked about it on the radio before, and a and yeah. a hand came and pulled me up, but I didn't see the whole person. And I accused a girl at the fountain pulling me up, and she said no, and she didn't see anybody either. But I saw it hmm. and felt it because I was in really deep water and taken on the water already, so it was a near death. Oh. So there's some things that you and I need to break down as to how much is close or dying or what happens to the brain and why do other beings help 
help you at at these times that people aren't neurologically looking at uh maybe right. neuroscience neurophenomenology i wonder if who that would be so, do you know i don't know but we need to put those in the ebook we'll put those in a kindle folks so you can uh read it maybe so well of experience. course i have done i have done a rather informative uh book called the seeker which i am putting the finishing touches on but it is an actual uh first episode or first uh, volume of a trilogy that basically in, uh, uh, lists all of my psychic, spiritual, supernatural, uh, sensitive encounters throughout the entirety of my life. Um, over the first book, I think covers, if I remember, to age about 30. And then the second book will go on and cover to about 45. And the last one will probably uh, discontinue at, at 55. And this is going to be a trilogy that I'm producing. And I've already pr- produced the first book, but I'm in the final and fifth stage of editing, editing with it. Now, I intend to also uh, break down and elucidate further on various adventures, such, such as living in New Orleans for 10 years. We can break that down into short short books and call it the Night Trekker series or something like that, uh, Night being my last name, of course. And trekking, of course, is basically when one ventures out around midnight or later and encounters you know, various spiritual entities or various psychic situations or supernatural situations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, I'm not trying to get off topic by any means, but um, yes, we can and will get together and produce who knows how many books before the year is out because I am a very, very fluent writer. I have, uh, you know, I can, I can type and uh, I can type a good uh, four or 500 words a minute and writing, it flows to me because I'm a wordsmith. So anyway, um, but yes, uh, it is diagrammatically um, very sensitive because you have life coming back after being completely legally dead, and then you have near-death experiences where the brain basically becomes succumbed in some way that you're no longer attuned to your regular five senses. Instead, you seem to go off into the, into some kind of altered state of consciousness and encounter angels and gods and goddesses and all kinds of other beings um, while you're away from your body. But you can also enter into this picture astral projection because astral projection itself is the leaving of the body to to go to the astral plane and to meet other people or to actually travel around the world and visit people you're concerned with. So you see, when it comes to, and those would become uh, OBEs, out-of-body experiences, um, and they're all kind of sandwiched in together because they all parallel to the extent being that we are all in an altered state of consciousness when any of these experiences occur. But, I mean, uh, I've had, you know, uh, there's been a, an episode where I, I nearly died because I was struck strucken down with pneumonia. And, you know, I was knocking on the desk door because I was so weak that I couldn't, you know, move around. I couldn't uh, help myself very much. Um, and the conditions were snow and ice, and, you know, my friends kept me alive by feeding me soup. And if it hadn't been for the soup, I'm sure I don't doubt in the least I would have passed because we were snowed in and no doctors of any kind were available due to the snow conditions. Um, and that happened when I was 19. So, I mean, you know, and, and the experience as far as dying and come back, that was actually 14. And then, of course, uh, at five, you know, uh, there was the ex- experience with the ETs and being abducted and then being planted back down here and becoming a savant of languages and that kind of thing. And then, of course, uh, there have been other experiences where I actually tried to commit suicide myself by extreme poisoning. And if it hadn't been for a friend that came to the house that had never visited me and walked me around and diluted the poison with gallons of water, I, we probably would not be having this conversation. Um, and there wow. have been that other instances. Severe there, depression. Yeah, there have been other instances where I mean I have experimented with LSD to the extent that I had gone into town on a ten-speed bike and went to see a movie, and about two-thirds of the way through the movie, all of a sudden the movie took on psychedelic uh, permutations, and when I got out of the place, I was able to get my bike and go riding on my bike, but the traffic all of a sudden became nothing but a war of colors. And so I ended up getting, managing to get to a park 
and I pulled my bike into the park, and I walked around for hours and hours not even knowing who, who I was until finally the uh, amount of LSD had been burned off in my brain enough that I became conscious once again of exactly who I was, where I was, and where I needed. experimented in the past with hallucinogens, but I have always looked at the experiments as just that, an experiment in consciousness. In other words, I always made the rule with myself that I would retain full control over my consciousness regardless of any psychedelic or illusionary or delusionary or uh, weird experiences that I had because of the inducement that was brought about by the drug that I had, I had ingested. Because I've also taken psilocybin and I've also done uh, mushrooms and uh, all of these kind of things. And again, uh, as long as you have a, a strong mindset, the drug does not basically um, take as much control of you as it would normally simply because you, you have defined for yourself that you're going to have an object lesson kind of experience rather than allowing the drug to completely. controlled experiments, but uh, mine were from, uh, we're going to have to separate all this clinical, non-clinical, oh, and uh, uh, psycho, uh, I don't know, nomic, psychodynamic, uh, <laughs> or, I don't know what processes of how we can change our brain activity, but I know a lot of people have uh, desired results from taking mushrooms. Or uh, a lot of kids are back on that high ayahuasca again. Uh, oh yeah. Not just DMT or dimethyltryptamine, but uh, we have multisensory awarenesses that just don't reach certain levels, and some people feel like they can't get there where they've heard about the levels or vibrations of energy. So there's mystical conceptions about what each state is. Now, some are delusionary and dissociative properties, but extraordinary and mystical experiences, uh, we're going to have to classify those that are intentional, natural, peaceful, and then near-death experiences that people have had psychological trauma from, and then we can do the same thing with coping uh, skills and those trying to escape or self-medicating. Like you said, you tried to take your life. Tommy did one time. Tommy Hawksblood, it used to be on here. Still my friend. I guess he's still alive. But natural briefing, how we could help each other. Now, this book, I think Dr. Richard Allen Miller would be the prime uh, third person for this book to discuss uh, herbs, mushrooms, and all that. He's a GS-18 folks. Uh, Richard and I both worked with the government as contractors, our, our reservists, our National Guard Reserve, and uh, Dr. Uh, Office of Personnel Management, DOD, and Richard here worked out, out of the country. Uh, so we've both done security detective work as well as hypnosis and out-of-body near-death and becoming mystics and metaphysicians, but Dr. Uh, Richard Allen Miller has asked uh, me in, to help, and I've asked Richard to help me on uh, all this near-death, out-of-body, and also, we've, uh, we're out of time, Richard, but tomorrow is Sunday Spiritual. I'll create right. that, and we'll discuss more extraterrestrial and the, and the uplifting human ET spirit side of how we foresee the future. A lot of people want to know what's in store. And how each individual, you know, can make your own apocalypse or uh, celebrate life. It just depends on are you, you know, do you want to stick around in this reality or not? So that's what we're right. going to be talking about tomorrow. And, uh, Richard, I apologize for any technical difficulty. It's not my normal. I haven't seen it. But I've never just acted like we were going to do a paranormal show and announce it to the world and LinkedIn and then uh, have busy numbers. So they wouldn't let anybody call in. I don't know if I wasn't cleared for paranormal. I, I started with paranormal before I went into spiritual, but I've always had spiritual, but uh, not sure what that was about. But I appreciate you calling me back and letting me get you on the show. And Thomas, uh, wait, why have I got time? Oh, I've got I don't wrong. know. It's Richard yes. Thomas night. So people, but he's going to go by Richard T. Knight, Dr. Rick, Pastor Rick. Tomorrow he's going to put his Pastor Rick hat on, but uh, I've got to put Richard Thomas. 
I'm so used to saying uh, Thomas, Richard Thomas. I've got Thomas T. Richard Thomas. So um, you can catch this on YouTube. You can catch it right here. Uh, just give it a minute to load, and you can come right back on blogtalkradio.com. Uh, and then you just put forward slash, which means what page or what radio show do you want. And this is TJ Morris ET Radio. It's my name, TJ, my initials. And I've had it so long, and I'm on so many uh, separate companies and separate radio shows and downloaded and distributed in Spotify and iHeart and Stitcher and Oh, all these other Spreaker, I can't tell you all of them. Out to Google, I'm, we're on Google, uh, all these places that do radio anyway. shows and podcasts. So just uh, check back tomorrow. Sunday will be our spiritual day, 4 to 6, and I hope people can get in. But if they don't, I guess, Richard, you'll get, you're a good talker. So you got a lot to share, I hope, for tomorrow for spirituality because maybe just you and me again. <laughs> and we'll share oh, well. more about near death. And uh, NDEs, OBEs, and all of that. Well, thank you, Richard. We're at the close, and so uh, how about same same time, same place tomorrow? Sounds great. All right, thank you so much, Richard. You did a great job. We really appreciate you helping us and sticking with us. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank all right. You. Thanks,